Today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Areas Center webinar series sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Center and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar titled The Art of Knowledge Exchange, Lessons from World Bank Experience and Adaptations for Marine Conservation presented by Phil Karp. Phil is a lead knowledge management specialist at the World Bank where he leads, designs, and leads design and implementation of various components of the World Bank's knowledge, learning, and innovation work, including South-South Knowledge Exchange, communities of practice, and knowledge networks and partnerships. He has more than 20 years of experience in the fields of knowledge, learning, and advisory services, with particular emphasis on practitioner-to-practitioner -practitioner and South-South Knowledge Exchange. He is also an avid scuba diver and ocean advocate and is actively involved in conservation of coral reef ecosystems, with particular focus on the interface between conservation and livelihood. Phil holds a graduate degree in economics and public policy policy from the University of California, Berkeley. We're very excited to have Phil here today. But before I turn it over to him, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your question into the Q&A box or chat, both of which are at the bottom of your screen, and we will pose the questions to Phil at the end of, end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Phil. Thank you, um, thank, thank you so much, Zach. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity <clears throat> to deliver this webinar. Um, as uh, Zach mentioned, uh, in my day job, I work at the World Bank, but uh, my passion is for our oceans, and um, I'm involved as both a citizen scientist and ocean advocate in um, particularly uh, coral reef ecosystem conservation. Um, what I want to do is to really share with you some of the experiences <clears throat> from the World Bank in an area of knowledge management, which is gaining a lot of attention, which is that of knowledge exchange, which involves the connecting aspects of knowledge management, as opposed to the collecting or codification or development of databases of knowledge. And what I'm gonna do during the time available is first give you an overview of a design methodology uh, for a knowledge exchange, and then talk about some implications and applications of this knowledge exchange methodology in the fields of marine science and marine ecosystem protection. Let me start with some broad definitions. Um, you know, what do we mean by knowledge exchange? We're really talking about the sharing of knowledge and experience across countries, regions, or projects for the purpose of accelerating development processes or solutions. In other words, to achieve some defined objectives. And why do we use knowledge exchange? It's um, proven to be a powerful way in which those who have a particular challenge can learn from peers who have overcome similar challenges, can access practical knowledge and solutions cost-effectively and share, replicate, or scale up solutions. And knowledge exchange is becoming a important alternative to uh, some more traditional forms of, of capacity building wherein experts would look at a particular positive experience, document it, and then try to transfer it to those who are looking for a challenge. Uh, we're finding that uh, in a world in which the, the what of uh, a particular solution is easily accessible through the web or elsewhere, practitioners or those who face challenges really want to understand the how, the why, the how-to aspects, uh, or the tacit knowledge, which most effectively comes through connecting with those who have overcome similar challenges. And I want to talk about a particular form of knowledge exchange, which is that focused on particular results, which situates a knowledge exchange within the context of a particular development challenge, addresses well-defined capacity constraints, ensures that the knowledge exchange is demand-driven, that it targets change agents, those who can actually affect change, and it focuses on concrete outcomes and results, and in doing so, facilitates the selection of appropriate instruments and activities in a systematic way. And I'm gonna 
be talking quite a bit about this latter two terms of instruments and activities, and I'll introduce them in a few minutes. Now, while knowledge exchange can be a powerful mechanism for catalyzing change, there are a number of challenges in ensuring that it's, the potential is effectively harnessed. These involve determining the best way to exchange knowledge effectively, figuring out how to get and to measure results and how to systematically integrate knowledge exchange as part of a larger change process. This was a dilemma that we faced at the World Bank when we recognized the importance and power of connecting um, practitioners who faced challenges with peers who had overcome these, but we didn't really know how to do this effectively. And through uh, both a combination of experience drawn from supporting well over 150 knowledge exchanges and uh, carefully assessing these, we developed both a methodology and a guidebook uh, on the how-to of knowledge exchange to help practitioners to achieve results. And it all introduces a systematic approach which allows you to scale up, replicate, innovate, and adapt solutions from one context to another. This was initially developed for World Bank staff, but it's now being used by client institutions and other development agencies in their operations and knowledge activities, as well as in uh, a number of uh, university curriculum on uh, knowledge management. There's multiple versions of the guidebook available focused on different sectors available in nine languages. And one version developed for the Global Environment Facility focuses on biodiversity and ecosystem protection, and in fact, has as its central case, uh, a case looking at uh, knowledge exchange among marine protected areas in the Philippines to help one of them, the Tanyan Straits um, biodiversity area, learn from the success of other MPAs in the country and internationally. The Art of Knowledge Exchange methodology introduces and provides guidelines for a five-step roadmap for design and implementation. The five steps involve anchoring a knowledge exchange in a broad change process, defining the main challenges and, um, and players involved, designing and developing by blending appropriate instruments and activities, implementing, measuring, and reporting results. Today's presentation will focus on the first three steps and most, in most detail, the third. This just gives you a quick overview of the whole roadmap. Uh, but as I said, I'm gonna be focusing mainly on steps one, two, and three uh, in this webinar. In order for a knowledge exchange to lead to action or to bring about change, we found that it should be anchored in an understanding of the broad objectives and the key obstacles that are constraining action or holding back change. Often we found that a knowledge exchange will be organized without really understanding how it fits within a broad change process and therefore it may miss the mark in terms of, of identifying the main institutional challenges that are holding back change or determining um, the capacity constraints that are holding back change. So for example, is the problem that is constraining achieving intended objectives one of a lack of understanding or awareness or is it lack of technical skills? Or is it lack of consensus among key stakeholders? Or lack of connections? Or lack of implementation know-how? It's important to understand these because otherwise you may go off in the wrong direction. For example, by organizing a technical workshop, looking at um, improving technical knowledge where the real problem isn't one of lack of technical knowledge or skill, but rather the lack of consensus or the lack of connections between actors. So the anchoring step simply allows you to assess and determine 
the main institutional challenges that are holding back change and what has to happen to address these. Once that's done, we move to defining the knowledge exchange. And here we're determining uh, intermediate outcomes. We're identifying the key participants that need to be involved and identifying the most appropriate knowledge providers or solutions. And the notion of intermediate outcomes is, uh, in my experience, one of the most powerful aspects of this methodology, because what it does, it uh, addresses one of the shortcomings of some of the more co common um, um, results chain ways of, of looking at results measurement. That of the, the gap that often exists, both in terms of time and attribution between outputs and outcomes. And when we're talking about a short-term intervention, such as a workshop or a conference or a knowledge fair, uh, it's difficult to be able to determine what in fact the impacts are and what the outcomes are of something that takes place over a short period of time. So the notion of intermediate outcomes allows us to be able to actually look at the specific attributable uh, outcomes derived from a particular knowledge exchange intervention and to be able to measure these within clearly defined uh, intermediate outcomes. And we've identified five different intermediate outcomes that we use within this methodology. Uh, new knowledge, enhanced skills, enhanced connectivity, improved consensus, and new and improved actions. The first two of these are ones that are felt at the level of individuals, uh, the second and third at the level of groups, and new and improved actions can either be for individuals or for groups. And as I said, these intermediate outcomes can be measured and attributed. Uh, this gives some sample intermediate outcomes uh, or indicators for some of the, the different intermediate outcomes. So for example, uh, new knowledge can be measured by looking at a raised awareness through focus groups, improved motivation and attitude, greater confidence, enhanced skills by new technical ability, new ability to apply knowledge, improved consensus by looking at behaviors such as better coordination, better cohesion, improved trust, and so forth. The second aspect of DEFINE is to determine who are the main participants that need to be involved? Not only the change agents who are going to affect change, but those who may influence or convene or be the main actors involved. And it's important to understand their characteristics in then defining or uh, um, designing the knowledge exchange. So for example, if your main stakeholders uh, and actors uh, come from you know, rural areas and have a limited level of formal education, then the type of exchange you put together is likely to be something different than say a technical conference or one that's making heavy use of technology or requires a um, uh, high level of connectivity. The next aspect of DEFINE is identifying the appropriate knowledge providers and or solutions. In other words, which individuals or groups have the most relevant and transferable knowledge and development experience or can offer a potential solution? And then equally importantly, do they have the resources and capacity to share it? The second aspect is something that we mistakenly um, took for granted in our early um, efforts to really uh, use knowledge exchange in a big way as a way of supporting uh, capacity building. To give you a couple of examples, um, we identified the Ministry of Statistics in Colombia as being a pioneer in terms of using uh, mobile um, 
mobile devices such as tablets and cell phones as a way of collecting national census data. They were the first country to do this, and many other countries quickly became interested in wanting to learn from them. So we organized a few exchanges, and what we found was that these were massive flops. Why? Because the people who work in the National Statistical Agency are statisticians. They're not people who have experience with communications. They're not people who have really analyzed why and how the use of mobile devices worked well in their census data. And they hadn't documented the process that they had gone through in introducing mobile devices for census taking. Another example was the, the Lagos Metropolitan Transport Authority, which was one of the few operators of bus rapid transit systems in Africa that was both efficient and profitable. So again, other countries in Africa wanted to learn from them, but they're traffic engineers. They had no experience at all in communicating why and how um, their processes and systems were working. So we recognized that we needed to not only identify solution providers who had the solutions, but also had the capacity to share them and actually developed a whole business line around building capacity for knowledge sharing. The other aspect I wanna mention when it comes to solutions is the increased availability of a number of online uh, platforms for identifying solutions to key development challenges. Um, a platform which some of you may be familiar with is Panorama, which includes as one of its thematic communities, the Blue Solutions platform, which has um, over 200 uh, solutions around various aspects of um, marine ecosystem conservation. And often uh, it can be an effective way of identifying a solution and then linking that to a provider who may be able to help in terms of addressing the needs of a particular challenge. So to recap where we are, we've talked about anchoring uh, a knowledge exchange in the broad change process. We've talked about defining um, what are the, the main capacity constraints, identifying the intermediate, intermediate outcomes, and identifying the participants and uh, knowledge or solution providers. Step three involves design and developing the exchange. And this is the one I wanna spend um, uh, a little bit more time on than I did on steps one and two. Basically, knowledge exchange design step three involves the selection of an appropriate blend and sequence of knowledge exchange instruments and activities. This is a terminology that uh, I mentioned at the outset and that I wanna now explain in a little bit more detail. Again, one of the problems that we encountered when we started to look at putting together a systematic uh, approach to uh, guiding design of knowledge exchange was the lack of any common typology or common definitions on terminology with respect to the modalities for knowledge exchange. So people for example, would use seminar and workshop and course interchangeably or conference and symposium without having common definitions or a hierarchy of which of those um, was most appropriate for a specific um, um, intermediate outcome or knowledge gap. And we used an analogy of, um, of, um, of dishes and a meal in thinking about our typology of modalities. So we have something called instruments, which are akin to uh, dishes in a meal. So in this particular case, we have, you know, a bread dish, a meat dish, and a salad. Those are instruments. But the salad consists of a number of ingredients. It has its lettuce, it has onions, it had carrots. These are activities. So let me relate that to a um, a knowledge exchange modality that many of you be, will be familiar with, that of a conference. So a conference is an instrument, but during a conference, you may have presentations, you may have a poster session, 
you may have a panel discussion, you may have a debate. Those are activities that are part of the instrument, which is the conference. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these in more detail. So we've identified um, about a dozen different instruments for knowledge exchange um, and have sort of type, categorized them in terms of the, the, the um, length of engagement. So those that are short term, medium term, and longer term. So short term engagements in terms of instruments might be a conference, an expert visit, or a study tour. Uh, a competition or a knowledge jam or a multi-stakeholder dialogue tend to be medium term and longer term would be a community or practice or a twinning arrangement. Now for each of these we've looked at developing a, um, a clear definition and most importantly determining which of the intermediate outcomes they are most effective and appropriate for. So a conference which we're all familiar with is best used for gaining new knowledge and for outreach to a large number of participants. Whereas a workshop is more geared toward enhancing skills or building networks and to collaborative discussion. A study tour geared toward gaining new knowledge, new way of doing things, forging networks and developing shared motivation an expert visit for enhancing skills, in-depth diagnosis, and so forth. The guidebook, um, and I'm gonna give you a link to where it's available online at the end of this webinar, uh, contains a toolkit that gives detailed um, both guidelines for each of the instruments as well as an indication of what they're best used for. Again, a knowledge, share, knowledge fair is most effective for sharing innovations, raising awareness, and building networks. It's important to look at the link between the instruments and their intermediate outcomes from a number of perspectives. First, the choice of instruments should always address the institutional challenge holding back change and target the intermediate outcomes you want to achieve. So as I mentioned earlier, if your main constraint is lack of consensus, so therefore your intermediate outcome you wanna address is improved consensus, then a technical workshop is probably not your best um, instrument. You would rather look at something like a um, multi-stakeholder dialogue. One instrument can help achieve multiple intermediate outcomes. Again, to give you an example, a study tour can be very effective in terms of raising awareness, but also it could be an effective way of building social capital by bringing together groups who may not necessarily agree with one another and by helping to build consensus as they experience the study tour together. And finally, the same instrument used at different stages can help yield different outcomes. So this is where the art in the art of knowledge exchange comes together because you can blend and sequence these instruments in a way that are gonna reinforce each other to uh, achieve a given desired intermediate outcome. So for new knowledge, a conference and a knowledge fair and a community of practice will blend nicely. For enhanced skills, a workshop, a knowledge jam, and an expert visit, just to give two examples. Now moving on in the design step, I want to introduce uh, the uh, aspect of menus and recipes, bringing back the notion of instruments as the dishes in the meal and the activities as the ingredients. Um, we've identified um, about 30 activities and we're coming up with additional ones um, um, almost um, you know, every month or so. And we've divided them depending on the modality of delivery. So we have some activities that are presentation activities such as demonstration or an expert panel or a lightning talk or a poster session. Those that involve discussion such as brainstorming or a buzz session or a knowledge cafe or peer assist. Those that are experiential such as action planning or a field visit, role play, 
simulation, and those that are analytical, such as a focus group or an interview or a survey, SWOT analysis. And once again, as with instruments, the activities are blended together and sequenced at the different stages of planning for the instrument, the delivery and follow up and monitoring. And collectively, this allows for a calculated and systematic approach to knowledge exchange design. So to give you an example, let's say you were gonna be um, organizing a knowledge fair as an instrument. At the planning stage, you might use discussion, either face-to-face -face or virtual among the organizers to agree on the scope. And then during the delivery, uh, activities that could be used include a knowledge cafe, peer assist, a poster session, anecdote circle. And then finally for follow-up and after action review with the leader of each booth to draw on lessons learned and to plan for the future. Our experience and that of other organizations that are using a similar methodology, including UNDP and others, is that good design really does make a difference. Well-designed knowledge exchanges can allow participants to experience something new, to internalize the significance of this new experience in a powerful way, to observe questions and reflect on their own contributions and experience, interact with other participants, um, translate their knowledge into action plans, and to codify knowledge gained. At the other extreme, a poorly designed knowledge exchange can be a colossal waste of money and even be counterproductive if, for example, it reinforces um, divisions or uses a solution or example which may not be appropriate to the context without effectively unpacking the why of why it worked in the situation where the knowledge provider is introducing it and why this may not be appropriate to that of the knowledge seeker in question. An additional consideration that I wanna mention is that of social media, which has really become a game changer in knowledge exchange. Uh, again, as with the activities, we've sort of tried to um, categorize the different types of social media into the way that they address uh, knowledge exchange from those that are intended to connect, such as Facebook or LinkedIn, those that um, record, such as YouTube or Vimeo, those that illustrate uh, Instagram, Picasa, it's an old one, I don't even know if it's still around anymore, those that uh, are intended to update in real time, such as Twitter or Blogger. Pros, I mean, we're familiar with the fact that social media allows for instant communications, huge reach, open access, crowdsourcing, but some of the cons are becoming increasingly uh, evident, particularly within our you know, current political context, in terms of the fact that they're often unfiltered, often unvalidated, and that the access is, while ubiquitous, not universal and may well in fact create divides if not everyone is able to access social media as the modality that you're using for knowledge exchange. Some quick thoughts on implications and applications of this knowledge exchange methodology and approach in the fields of um, marine science and marine ecosystem protection. Just some quick ideas. One is encouraging you to broaden the range of instruments and activities used in exchanging knowledge. I, from what I've noted within particularly the marine conservation community, there's a tendency to focus on a few uh, instruments, such as a scientific uh, congress or a uh, study visit or a technical workshop without necessarily having explored the range of options available or having gone through the type of systematic analysis of who the change agents are, what you want to achieve, and what uh, instrument would be most effective. Another is to recognize and embrace the involvement of new actors, including citizen scientists and local communities. 
and I'm going to give an example of related to that in a couple of minutes. Understand and make use of social media. Uh, I have to say that um, um, from my perspective, um, I think that uh, the marine conservation and marine science community is probably among the most media, social media savvy uh, it, within the conservation field, but still um, there's probably room for even more understanding and use of, of this modality. Uh, encourage you to experiment with different ways of communicating research findings and activities. Um, analyze, understand, and engage accordingly with the range of stakeholders and to use knowledge exchange to accelerate innovation and, and replication of successful solutions. I'm going to give some examples from uh, a particular marine conservation challenge, which those of you who know me know is, um, is uh, close to my heart, which is that of the fight against invasive lionfish. I imagine most of you are familiar with the problem, but for those who may not be, in a nutshell, we have two species of Indo-Pacific lionfish that have invaded marine ecosystems in the Western Atlantic and are causing um, uh, a large degree of, of negative impact. Um, the lionfish invasion of the Western Atlantic was described as the worst marine invasion ever um, by a scientific journal um, in 2015. And in 2010, it was identified as one of the top 15 threats to global biodiversity by uh, a range of scientists. So the invasion is a huge problem, but how to communicate this, particularly to non-scientists, this is a challenge. S some examples of how this is being done in innovative ways. This is a, uh, a, um, um, an automated um, uh, graphic developed by the US Geological Service, Reef and NOAA, which very effectively demonstrates in about 35 seconds, both the growth, the spread uh, and magnitude of the invasion in a way that is very much in your face. Another effective tool for communications is infographics. Again, a very good infographic here, which pulls out some of the data related to the invasion, both in terms of the reason why um, lionfish um, are so prolific and why the invasion has spread so much, as well as the impact on native fish and on native marine ecosystems. And what about social media? In this case, the combination of social media and new actors uh, can fundamentally change the game in how results of scientific research are disseminated and exchanged. And again, I want to give an illustration from the fight against invasive lionfish. This is a screenshot of live tweets from the 2014 Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute conference, where there was a special session on the latest research on invasive lionfish. And uh, Mark Hickson, who um, is probably the marine scientist who has been looking at the bio biology of of lionfish for the longest, now at University of Hawaii, and has also been looking at the invasion, was presenting a new paper uh, in which he noted that lionfish had been shown to reduce recruitment of juvenile fish by 94%, an average of five species locally extinct with the presence of lionfish. So some pretty dramatic findings, right? Now that same afternoon, um, Serena Hackeret was defending her MA thesis at University of North Carolina and the, her presentation was being live tweeted. Her topic, the impact of lionfish on coral reef ecosystems in Belize and the summary they gave at the beginning was that her research shows that lionfish are having no influence on reef fish abundance, species richness or diversity. Quite different from what had been tweeted out in the morning, right, from Hickson's uh, latest paper. So we then basically had uh, a number of tweets and a dialogue ensued in which she was being asked to how to reconcile this 
with findings of Hickson and others with respect to the large degree of, of impact that uh, the lionfish invasion was having um, on local ecosystems. A dialogue ensued in which I want to make two points, two interesting points. First, that the highlights from his new research were injected into an MA thesis defense 2,000 miles away, five and a half hours later. And that this connection was made not by a thesis advisor or a peer reviewer, but by a citizen scientist, in this case, who happened to be yours truly. So last but not least, I want to I, 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 I want to talk about the importance of new actors and how they can bring new ideas and innovations. And again, from the fight against invasive lionfish, one of the challenges in that um, uh, in that fight is how to sustain the regular removals that are needed to allow for recovery of populations of native species. Now, the, the answer traditionally, traditionally is probably the wrong term in this, but the, the, the answer that was coming from MPA operators was regular culling by MPA personnel and volunteer divers through um, lionfish rodeos and the like. But this is highly expensive, labor intensive, and questionable as to its sustainability. So what happened, we have artists, citizen scientists, and NGOs coming along with a particular new solution, lionfish jewelry. Lionfish fins and spines and even a perculum can be used to craft beautiful jewelry and other handicraft items. These jewelry markets offer multiple benefits, including awareness raising, increased return to fishers, new livelihood opportunity, and women's empowerment. So, okay, that's interesting, but how does it relate to the, per the topic of this webinar? Remember this slide, why use knowledge exchange? That it's a powerful way to learn from peers who have overcome similar challenges, to access practical knowledge and solutions, and to share, repl replicate, and scale up. The lionfish jewelry idea started in Belize in the middle of 2014, but has quickly spread to other countries through knowledge exchange, workshops, peer assist, and social media. There are now clusters of lionfish jewelry artists in Belize, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Colombia, and individual artists in other locations. And because of the combination of the, these modalities of knowledge exchange, most notably social media, the product innovation cycle has been significantly increased and accelerated through the sharing of different design and production techniques. Um, I looked on uh, Etsy um, just a week ago and found more than 30 different Etsy store shops that are selling lionfish jewelry. When I looked at it in 2015, there were three. So the different platforms, as well as the innovative cycle through knowledge sharing has really made an impact here. So this is just one example of how peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange combined with the dissemination power of social media and the role of new actors can help to share solutions to challenges in the realm of marine ecosystem protection. So I wanted to bring a lot of uh, what I said at the outset back to the field that uh, I believe most of you are in um, to give some example of the relevance. So um, with that, I want to um, close the presentation part of the webinar. Um, uh, on this last screen, which we'll leave up during the Q&A, you have links to both the Global Environment Facility edition of the Art of Knowledge Exchange, uh, which is uh, downloadable as a PDF, as well as the standard edition, and finally, my contact information. So again, thanks everyone for attention during this presentation part. And now I'll turn back over to, um, to Zach, who's going to moderate 
the Q and A. Thanks, Phil. That was a really interesting presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, so just a reminder to everyone to please put your questions into the Q&A box or the chat, both of which can be found on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we have one question already. Someone asked traditional ecological ways of knowing from indigenous communities, for example, or from multi-generational fishermen are increasingly val validated as valuable ways of knowing. These types of information are often difficult to measure, but this model uses measuring knowledge as one main way to validate, monitor, and distribute information. How are traditional ecological ways of knowing measured in this model and incorporated into management and sharing? If possible, please use examples from past projects. So I can't give you a specific example that I'm aware of, but I could tell you um, how I would certainly approach this because I do feel that traditional ways of knowing um, can fit well within this approach. Um, obviously, the uh, way in which first you're going to capture that traditional way of knowing is going to have to be quite different than would be the case with um, perhaps a form of more um, um, of technical knowledge, it would have to be um, captured and documented through um, through interviews and perhaps even um, um, then sort of documented in audio form in addition to written form, involving the those who are um, the main um, holders, if you will, of those traditional ways of knowing is going to need to be quite different than would be the case, say, with someone coming from a technical institute. And the way in which you would share by connecting them with either other you know, traditional communities that could benefit from um, that way of knowing, as well as the, or even uh, institutions that are also uh, focused more around um, what we could, would consider more modern or scientific modes of knowledge uh, would need to be done in ways that uh, would focus highly on oral and direct connection through things such as storytelling, through uh, things such as demonstration and the like. So those would be my, my quick um, uh, responses in terms of measuring. Uh, measuring, I think you would be looking at the way in which those traditional modes of knowledge might be um, used to change behaviors. Um, you'd be looking at awareness raising. You'd be looking at uh, new and improved action um, through um, observation, um, potentially through oral surveys, through focus groups and the like. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have reads, can you explain twinning and give an example of how it is used? Yes, so twinning is, um, uh, is, is used very much um, within the private sector. Uh, it's essentially a form of uh, benchmarking in which two organizations would basically agree to um, share in a, an exchange in a, in, in, in a um, medium to long-term structured fashion in which they would actually share um, um, some of their processes and techniques. They might have staff exchanges, secondments. I'll give you a specific example of the use of twinning uh, in my world. Um, this basically um, took place in at the time where the country of uh, Myanmar was beginning to open up and move to a market economy and it's um, uh, the Budget Bureau in the Ministry of Finance wanted to establish some more uh, up-to-date and modern techniques for both budget preparation, uh, budget implementation and monitoring and the World Bank helped to put together a twinning arrangement with the uh, Ministry of Finance of Thailand, a country where there was quite a bit of, um, say, cultural uh, affinity and similarity. So it started out by having, so the, the twinning arrangement was the instrument. So what were some of the activities? Uh, an expert visit by uh, someone from the bu Budget Bureau of, um, of Thailand to Myanmar to assess the current situation of the way budgeting was being done. 
followed by a study tour uh, in, in which the, uh, some staff from the uh, Myanmar Budget Bureau visited uh, Thailand to see how it ran its budgeting, then followed by a uh, secondment of a number of staff uh, from the Budget Bureau of Myanmar to spend six months working in the Budget Bureau in Thailand, and then finally uh, a series of follow-up expert visits as well as monitoring and on-call, on-demand um, expertise and technical support from the Budget Bureau of uh, Thailand. So that essentially was the twinning arrangement between these two budget bureaus. Thank you. The next question reads, how do you reconcile the typical hierarchical arrangement between academic and community knowledge for an effective knowledge exchange? It really depends on um, the, the way in which you're defining, uh, you know, academic knowledge, if we're defining in terms of, um, you know, highly codified, peer-reviewed, and the like, um, as opposed to trying to bring, uh, you know, knowledge down to uh, a, both a use of language and terminology that's going to be understandable to broader audiences, I think that's where I, I, you know, I go back to um, my, some of my examples um, with respect to the way in which um, you know, academic findings are communicated. Um, there is a, a, a slide that I took out, but that I have, which uh, was very interesting, where uh, I show a, um, the title from a peer-reviewed um, you know, journal article which uses all of the, you know, the jargon. Um, and then the authors tweeting out to crowdsource say, can we come up with a title here and a way of communicating uh, our findings that's gonna be more broadly accessible and basically engaging with a broad range of stakeholders, uh, recognizing that the way in which they were communicating through the you know, peer reviewed journal article was not effective in reaching some of the broad audiences that they wanted to. So I think that would be a nice example of the way in which some scientists had tried to you know, reconcile uh, those differences. Great. The next question is, can you please discuss whether there is value in developing a knowledge exchange between traditional knowledge experts and practitioners working to increase political power, say towards true co-management from different legal and political contexts? Absolutely. Um, I think that that's, in fact, the, 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 that, that is a great example of, um, of a, a, a type of a, a, a knowledge or solution that really involves a lot of um, sort of tacit how-to, uh, understanding the different political contexts, understanding how different stakeholders can come together. And uh, I think really the, you know, the only way that you could effectively communicate and be able to replicate uh, the way in which you know, some um, you know, traditional groups might have been effective in affecting um, um, change and ad addressing political constraints is by having them um, come together and to share and understand each other's situations. Uh, again, if it's traditional um, uh, leaders or traditional groups, oral type presentations such as storytelling or anecdotes tend to be very effective in that context, um, given the fact that that is, fits well within the way in which they uh, have you know, traditionally and within their cultural way of uh, communicating um, and disseminating um, you know, traditional knowledge and findings. Thank you. The next question asks, any advice on advancing knowledge exchange among networks of networks? Networks of networks. Uh, among ne networks, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, a, a number of, you know, knowledge exchanges among networks where they've looked at aspects such as, um, you know, member 
um, sort of servicing the different platforms that are involved, um, how you sustain a community or network um, that uh, largely uh, interacts virtually, um, how you then move it into something that becomes more permanent. Um, networks of networks, um, you know, I think similarly you would want to uh, be in a position to first identify a network of networks that would be, um, you know, a good uh, sort of um, uh, source of good practice and solution for another network of networks that wanted to learn from them to address, you know, a, a particular problem. I mean, there's nothing wrong with uh, a knowledge exchange which doesn't start out with a clearly defined um, set of challenges that it's looking at addressing. Um, broadening uh, and sharing is, uh, you know, often has benefits in its own right. Um, but knowledge exchange can be most effective in a change process, going back to my sort of one of my key messages, if it is in fact uh, looking at um, addressing a particular well-identified challenge uh, and then determining you know, what needs to change and who is in a position to affect that and then who can bring um, uh, good solutions and good practice uh, that's worked elsewhere and why. Uh, network of networks is a more of a amorphous type situation and you know one where it may be a little bit more difficult to determine uh, the problem that you're looking at addressing um, and then identifying you know an appropriate um, um, other network of network to exchange with. Uh, I suspect that, that that probably didn't answer the question very well but um, that's what comes to mind. Thanks. Uh, as more of a where to find something question, we have someone who says they're looking at the two websites you've posted on the slide that's currently up, and they're looking for the sector specific resources but are having trouble finding them. Uh, do you know where they can find those or is there a link that you can provide that we can share? Sorry, which resources? The sector specific resources. Oh, so sector specific. Um, yeah, but, uh, good question. Um, there is actually a, um, a another page, which um, what would be the web best way for me to share, Zach, that links to um, all of the different versions? The can we send it? Can we, can, can we send it as a follow up? Because it's going to take me a few minutes to find. Yeah, no problem. We can definitely. So yeah, Thank you. I will provide that to uh, to Zach to be sent as a follow up. But thanks, whoever raised that question. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, we do have a um, uh, a website that has PDFs, downloadable PDFs of uh, all the sector versions as well as all the different language versions. Thank you. The next question we have <clears throat> addresses the problem of trying to make. Uh, trying to make an event more useful to a broad audience. They ask that they say that they're in the process of creating the fourth annual New York Seafood Stomach Summit. The lead organizer on the team is a scientist at NOAA and New York Sea Grant. It's still a very small event despite the size of the city and its region. And they're asking how they can make it more useful to fishers and seafood producers when connecting with scientists, chefs, fishmongers, and others who care about the future of sea life in combination with local production of seafood in our state. So towards that question more generally, how do you make such things more available to a wider audience? So, I mean, a number of, of thoughts come to mind. Um, in terms of, you know, more accessible to wider audience is anything from use of, you know, social media to um, not only announce the event, but also to have some, you know, quick interviews, um, to interview chefs, to raise awareness perhaps about a particular, um, you know, new sustainable, um, you know, seafood item. Um, having um, 
using competition, cooking competitions, getting, you know, chefs together. Uh, again, I, I imagine that some of these may already have been utilized, but I'm just, um, you know, throwing out the various um, modalities that can be utilized. Um, gamification. So if you wanted to get a broader set of, um, um, of, um, uh, of stakeholders visiting the, um, you know, the, the, the seafood show, uh, you could do things like, um, you know, having um, a scavenger or treasure hunt type situation where people have an app and they get points for the number of booths that they visit, um, having, um, you know, uh, tasting, um, things that essentially engage people in a way other than, uh, say, more traditional presentations or just having um, you know, the different information about the different um, um, uh, types of seafood available. Things that get people involved and get them to do something uh, is more, most likely to internalize and then to get them to be interested in uh, sharing and spreading um, the information either through word of mouth or otherwise. So again, some of these things may have already been uh, utilized, but um, I, I, I'd say look at the palette of experiential uh, type of uh, activities and um, try some of those that you may not have utilized um, so far. Great, thank you. Uh, we have someone who has asked, has the lionfish example been well documented in the knowledge exchange framework? And is there a collection of such examples somewhere that could be accessed? Um, so the, 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 um, the knowledge exchange aspect of the, um, lionfish jewelry, um, hasn't been documented. Lionfish jewelry as a, um, as a approach to, um, raising landed value and encouraging removals, um, has been, um, written up, um, as a, uh, a, you know, a paper that was presented um, during the 2015 uh, Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute conference. I was the, actually the lead author on the paper. Uh, it looked at um, both how the markets have spread as well as a measurement of um, the increase in landed value for per fish when uh, jewelry was included along with fillets and um, and whole fish. Thank you. And I, um, I'm actually in the process of working with, hopefully, with uh, UNDP to organize a um, an immersive knowledge exchange around integrated approach to lionfish management um, that would take place in uh, Belize and bring. Um, um, MPA and other marine conservation stakeholders from other countries in the Caribbean as well as the Mediterranean to Belize for a peer-to-peer uh, -peer knowledge exchange. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have time for one more quick question. It's just, is the guide available in other languages? Yes, so it's available actually now in nine languages. Um, Let's see if I can, off the top of my head, it's obviously uh, available in um, French, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Japanese, um, Bahasa, Indonesian, Chinese, uh, I think in, um, in Thai, uh, and I forget um, what other additional languages. This is the basic guide. Um, the, um, the, the GE, the Global Environment Facility uh, version is available in French, Spanish, and uh, Portuguese in addition to English. Fantastic. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I apologize to anyone whose question did not get answered. We will be forwarding the questions on to Phil for him to take a look at. And thank you, Phil, for the wonderful presentation. Um, thank you all and have a good day. Thank you, Zach, for the moderation, and uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in.